and welcome to another episode of the Aranax podcast. My name is Craig Eason. I'm your host and also owner and editor of the Fathom World website. And with me today is Bo Sarah Simonson. Bo, thank you for letting me come into uh, the Merced McKinney Muller Centre for Zero Carbon Shipping. Shipping. Well done. It's a, thank you. <laughs> it's, a, it's a long name. But uh, the full name, I think, is a very important part mm-hmm. of whom what you are. I'm here in Copenhagen, um, but right in the centre of Copenhagen, Denmark. And I, th- I think for the start, I want you to explain to me what the centre is and kind of its origins, if you, if you like. Because maybe some people haven't heard of how the centre came to be. And we'll talk a little bit about um, what its objectives are as well. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Craig. And thanks for inviting me. Um, the original idea uh, for the center was developed between the AP Müller Foundation, which is uh, the foundation that owns a majority stake in the AP Müller Mask Company, but it also owns uh, a lot of other things. So it was developed between the AP Müller Foundation and the AP Müller Mask Company which is a company that most people know uh, as the MERS company, the integrated logistics and shipping company with all the containers and, and the beautiful uh, brand and so on. So the idea was developed between the two. And the AP Miller Foundation is basically supporting uh, a lot of activities for the greater good. They, for example, have donated the opera in Copenhagen. They have supported a lot of educational activities, a lot of cultural activities, etc, etc, etc. And they were basically asking the question, so if, if, if this foundation was to do something to support sustainable shipping, what could that look like? And, and Merck generated a, a number of ideas for that. Um, and then one of the ideas was to develop a, an independent center that would work with the ecosystem, the players in the private sector, uh, government agencies, etc., in the public sector, and help that ecosystem to figure out how to decarbonize in time, Um, what does it take, what are the barriers, what needs to be resolved to get this going, and then also help to work with the players to actually concretize those activities and and get them going. And so these would be activities from innovation activities to develop new technologies. Uh, It would be demonstration activities to show that it is possible to run uh, these new solutions. And it would be also on on the standards and on the regulatory side uh, to to really work uh, with with the right uh, organizations to develop the standards that will define how this uh, sustainable shipping is going to work. Uh, And of course, also with government agencies and and member states of of IMO and and EU to really uh, work on developing the the future regulations that will drive shipping. So the basic idea was really to, to, to put a new player into the ecosystem that would be completely independent from any country or any uh, commercial organization or any NGO and just have <clears throat> one objective in mind and that is accelerate the transition towards uh, zero carbon shipping with whatever are the most effective uh, means to accelerate that. But you, you've inherited the name of the foundation, the um, mm. Merck and McKinney Muller name. Yes. You, you say you're independent, but you've still got the name. How are you going to demonstrate that independence while still bearing that name? Mm. Um, are, you, are you saying that the name is a, is a benefit to you? But I'm, I'm guessing you're going to have to, in the market particularly, you're going to have to overcome some of those questions about that independence bearing such a well-known yes, name. That's very true. I mean, the name is a tremendous strength to us. It opens all doors, basically, with government agencies and companies and NGOs across the globe. It's an extremely well-established name, the Merck name. Uh, and, and, and as a starting point, few people understand 
that there's any difference between us and the MERS company, to be honest. So we have to be very consistent, we have to be very concrete, and we have to be very clear uh, in the way we explain that we are not uh, the shipping and logistics company. We are an independent player. And that is, of course, uh, something that we do in, in, our, in the way we brand ourselves. Uh, it is in all the communication going out of the center, whether it's PowerPoint presentations or it's articles in newspapers and media, we, make a, we, we always check that we are not seen as the MERS company. And then eventually, eventually it will also be increasingly clear from, from what we are doing that we are not, uh, we are not the company. We, we um, I mean, the AP Miller MERS company uh, is running a, a, a large container shipping company, for example, um, and we are working with the entire shipping industry. So we're working with, with all uh, types of ships, for example. So our analysis, our stories are about all types of ships. Our perspective on fuel is basically on all available fuel types, whereas MERS need to make their selection and figure out what do they and, want and to And they, at the moment, showing that they're demo dem demonstrating at the moment, they're going towards methanol. They are focused a lot on yeah. methanol at the moment for a set of very good reasons. And we have a wider perspective on, on, mm. on the fuel pathway. So, so when you go into the detail of this, you will see that there are some distinct differences in what we're working with and how we're working, of course, uh, and also in our positions. And you've, you've got a number of partners that are coming into the centre as well, off, offering um, mm -hmm. not necessarily funding um, for the centre, but kind of funding in kind. Mm -hmm. they, they have staff that sit here in the centre. I've walked around the centre now and seeing you've got staff from different organisations sat here working yes. on projects, on strategies, mm -hmm. uh, with permanently employed uh, members of the uh, Zero Carbon Centre here um, in Copenhagen. How is that uh, helping you with your positioning as you move forward? How do you bring in those elements from the partners? Because some of the partners have got their own commercial objectives. Mm -hmm. In the same way that you you say that ship owners like Maersk have got their own direction they're going for, companies that are partners, um, associations yes. that are coming and uh, helping you with some of the project, they'll have their own agendas, they'll mm -hmm. have their own... Um, focal points. How do you bring all of that in, but still balance it so that you've got that independence, you're not under influence, because I, you're working towards the um, the regulatory side of things here. Mm -hmm. So I think it's quite important that you demonstrate that you're able to do that with a strong level of independence. Exactly. No, independence is absolutely key to us. And at the same time, it is also very important for us that we understand the real, you can say, the real business. Mm. Um, so so um, it, if I step back uh, a little bit, um, the main objective for us is basically to, to, to demonstrate that it is possible to decarbonize shipping in the first place, to create confidence that it is possible to to decarbonize shipping uh, in time uh, and to do that in a credible way. And, and in order to do that in a credible way, we need to work with uh, the companies and the countries that, uh, that can help demonstrate in a very concrete manner how, how, how can that be done. So that is not to say we're, we're not sort of giving any kind of exclusivity, but we're trying to lay out a number of pathways where we're saying that shipping can decarbonize with these different opportunities. We can go with methanol, we can go with ammonia, we can go with methane, we can go with bio oils, etc. And each of these pathways can play a role uh, in, uh, in the decarbonization. And then our our point here is that in order for those pathways to really contribute to solving the problem, we have to be clear on a number of things. We have to be clear on, for example, the life cycle impact of the fuels. 
uh, we have to be clear that the safety levels need to be high. Uh, so, so, uh, so what we're trying to do is really to, to, to bring forward those pathways and say they are possible, but to also say uh, in order for them to really help solve the problem, uh, we are pointing to the different, uh, you can say, development gaps, the different development needs that need to be established in order for them to really be a solution. So if you take some examples here, for example, uh, LNG and methane is a pathway. But for this to be truly good for the climate, we need to make sure that we manage the potential uh, methane slip uh, challenge. Okay, so, so then we work with partners across uh, the value chain to understand how much biomethane could be produced. How could you transport that around? How could you manage the methane upstream uh, from the ship in order to to manage the methane slip. And when you burn the ship on board the fuel, how do you make sure that you don't get methane slip or how do you manage uh, that part? And likewise with the other pathways, they all have sort of their limitations and their development gaps. And, and we're trying to work to understand that. And then the point here also from being independent is that we, we publish that with all the data and the methods we are using so people can see how did we develop our views on on methane or ammonia or methanol or whatever how did we develop those views what is the data we are basing this on and if somebody has better data or a different set of assumptions we are completely open to to discuss and and learn from uh, from the world around us so it's <clears throat> how do how do we stay independent i think it's very much about uh, being transparent about uh, the what we are doing and, and, and how we are developing our, our positions. Be transparent, be open for input, be, be always willing to, to discuss and change views if there's new data, uh, etc. So, so that's the only way we can maintain that uh, credibility. Does that, that, does that level of transparency or the promise of transparency potentially offer a, an additional challenge you because this isn't an industry that is noted for its willingness to be transparent so you saying you're transparent but you're going to your partners you're going to other companies um, ship owners for example mm -hmm. you know and trying to find out how their transparency is are you going to find it difficult to get the data that you want if you're going to be 100% transparent about how that date what that data is that is a big part of being a professional collaboration platform, as, as, as is in our vision, is to be extremely professional about the data. And so uh, during this first year of operation, I think we have matured that very well, so that when we published our first industry transition strategy last year, and the supporting documentation for that, we could actually publish data from our partners that were aggregated and anonymized according to competition law etc uh, and 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 bring that forward so you can find uh, that data in in the reports from from last year and and our partners all agreed to sharing uh, that data so i think this was a tremendous and very concrete example about collaboration so here we had energy companies bringing data about projections of future cost of renewable energy, for example. We had technology providers talking about the cost of electrolysis and engine technologies. We had ship owners bringing data about operational, technical operational profiles, etc. And then we put everything into a techno-economic simulation tool. We published the method that we're using. We published all the anonymized data that we're using. And then we get the results out and we can talk about how fast can we decarbonize the shipping sector? What is it going to cost? What are the implications in terms of uh, the need for renewable energy and so on and so forth? So I think this way of working is really quite, uh, quite powerful. Very much what you're saying about this um, need for independence and the positioning um, and the objectives that you've got within the center to achieve this decarbonization within three decades. 
when you're looking towards the position that you will play towards the regulatory side of this, whether it be Europe, because you're looking at all the European regulations, as well as the regulations at the IMO, how do you therefore avoid being part of that lobby group sort of mentality and going into a position there um, and start lobbying for something rather than being an information provider or, a, or, or some other sort of element of that building up of the knowledge mm. to support regulatory change that the policymakers may need mm. rather than being a lobby group? Mm. I, 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 I probably see where you're coming from um, but the way we are the way we are working is that uh, we first of all uh, we are um, I would say we are agnostic to the types of technologies and and the fuels we really don't care whether it's a fuel cell or an internal combustion engine or one, one or the other uh, type of fuel. The only thing we care about is that the solutions we are promoting and working with, they are truly uh, benefiting the climate. So that's like the starting point. Um, so in a way, you, you, you could call us a lobby, but we are not a lobby organization for a particular set of fuels or technologies like a lobby groups would typically be. The only thing we work for is that we get regulation that supports decarbonization of shipping and what we're bringing to the table is techno-economic analysis which can help you know shed light on how are these different uh, regulatory options what are, what are the implications going to be so right now for example we have done a big study on a big analysis of the current uh, fuel standards, a proposal for fuel standards and the ETS, the Emission Trading Scheme for Europe, uh, which is going to include shipping and looked at what are the implications of that and is it good enough? Uh, does, it, does it decarbonize shipping fast enough or, or, um, or, or do we need to take additional measures? And those analyses are, of course, using all the information we have gathered from many, many different sources. But they're not biased towards any particular company or any particular technology or fuel or anything like that. So I think that's exactly the right way. It is extremely detailed and uh, and and uh, you, you could say real-life calibrated data that we are using. So when we talk about, for example, what are the emissions from, from ships, we know exactly what the emissions are. We know what the operational profiles are. We know what the engines on board are, etc., etc., etc. So it's not, I think the, the great value of this is that it's, that it's based on real-life data and real-life uh, models. So, so we can say with great confidence when, when we put our views forward on these future regulations, we have actually great confidence in, in, in the substance and depth of, of our positions. It's, it is exactly not based on, you can say, some predetermined uh, investment or business interest in a, in a particular fuel which a lobbying group would normally have. They would often get together because they want to promote a certain set of solutions that they have invested in because they think it's a good thing. But, but that's not where we're coming from. We're basing it purely on, on data and analysis. Professor Herb Simonson, head of the Mercer McKinley Muller Center for Zero Carbon Shipping. Thank you very much. Um, that's all we've got time for today. Thank you very much for your time. I will be back because I know you've got a lot of projects that you're revealing a lot of information yeah. uh, for soon. So I'm going to be back talking to probably some of your staff about some of the more detailed stuff and things. But for this episode of the Aaron X podcast, thank you very much. And if you're listening to the podcast, you can go to fathom.world to get more details about other podcast episodes and the, uh, the newsletter that you can also subscribe to. Until the next time, goodbye for now.